you As I got another rhyme, another rhythm for y'all to listen I'm never quitting on my mission, I'ma roll with what I'm giving Got some ambition, this new edition, filling positions Looking at the void in myself and feeling what's missing Better watch the way you going, better go in the right direction In the moment you stressing, but you gon' be counting blessings And I know that for certain, keep on working, open curtains Haters swerving, cause they ain't ready for your final version I'm never gonna give up, give up Fall down, I just gotta get up, get up, yeah Cause this is my road Let's camera action, I'm ready to go you're listening to the Tom Ficklin Show on WNHHLP 103.5 FM, your home for community radio. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Tom Ficklin Show. My name is Gary Tinney, and I'm sitting in for Tom Ficklin. And again, I thank everyone for participating this morning. First and foremost, we'd like you to uh, introduce yourself where you're from, your rank, uh, any organization that you belong to, any chapter of the IABPFF. Um, but again, I appreciate it. I know you guys are really busy, especially during these times, and we pray for all the families and the departments that have lost members. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, we'll start from uh, Ms. Stowe, Denise. Hi. My name is Denise Stowe. I'm a Philadelphia firefighter. I uh, have about two years on the job now, so I'm still kind of new, um, but I'm glad to be here. And thank you for inviting me on. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chief Washington. Hello, my name is uh, Chief Washington. I am the fire chief for the city of Decatur. I've been in the fire service, uh, I think about 29 years now. Um, I am a longtime member of the International Association of Black Professional Firefighters, as well as Black women in the fire service, as well as women in the fire service. So I am just so happy to be here and engage with all of these beautiful young ladies that have joined us today. And I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, again, Chief Washington, I really appreciate you taking the time off and Participate in this most important issue about African. Uh, next, we have uh, Battalion Chief Lisa Forrest out of Philadelphia. Lisa? You would let me follow my sister. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> that's, my, that's my mentor and friend. Uh, yes. My name is Lisa Forrest, Battalion Chief in the Philadelphia Fire Department. 18 going on 19 years, uh, newly promoted battalion chief going on two years. Well, it'd be two years in September. Currently assigned to the hazmat unit, also still uh, a firefighting chief as well. And my other hat that I wear is Club Valiance president. Club Valiance is a chapter of the IABPFF. So I've been, a, been the president for six years of that. And I am excited being on this show today with such greatness. You know, I feel honored to even be in the same room with the wonderful women in fire service, um, in the fire service. So thank you for having me. And hello again, ladies. Great, great to see you. And thank you again. Um, next, we have uh, Lieutenant Moore out of Bridgeport, Connecticut. You're uh, the mute. Okay. There we go. Hello, everybody. Hello, ladies. Hi. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is uh, Lieutenant Monique Petway Moore. I am a 16 year veteran for Bridgeport Fire Department. I am also a long I'm at work, y'all. So y'all know, y'all hear it in the background. <laughs> um, I'm also a longtime member of the International Association for Professional Black Firefighters, as well as the Bridgeport Fire Birth Society. Um, I am also just elated to be here with you women and congratulations to all of you. Um, I'm super proud and I'm super inspired by the, the female chiefs that I'm seeing up here on today. Wonderful. Um, again, thank you. Thank you for taking your time. Um, again, I realize everyone's busy. Most of our folks are working and 
So uh, again, appreciation to sit here and see all this greatness is wonderful. And I just wanted to let folks know this is this is what we have throughout. You know, you talk about a network of individuals right in front of you. So really take advantage, connect, network, and and ask the questions. You can really reach out to them because, um, like uh, Battalion Chief Forrest said, we have mentors. Mentors play a major part in our lives. So again, I'll go to Sheila. I I think Sheila is out of uh, California. Hi, good morning. Um, I like to first say that it is a pleasure to be here and be amongst such an esteemed group of women. Um, my name is Sheila Hunter, and I'm currently a lieutenant with the San Francisco Fire Department. Um, I've been in for a little over 30 years, and it's um, probably about time to retire. <laughs> so that'll be happening sooner than later. But that's... um. And as far as like with associations, I'm a member of the San Francisco Black Firefighters, and I'm also a member of the Women uh, Women in Fire Service um, organization. And that's about all I have for now. Well, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for your service. Ooh, over 30 years. That's yeah, it's, it's a while. <laughs> so I'm sure you have a lot to talk about. <laughs> uh, we'll see, we'll see. Okay. All right, next I would like to introduce Stacy. Okay, um, my name is Stacy Carter. I'm a firefighter with the Philadelphia Fire Department. I've been on the job for seven years, um, six years as a firefighter, a year as an EMT. Um, I am a member of Club Valiance, the Black Firefighters Associate, uh, Organization. Um, and I'm happy to been, have been asked to come on today. Um, and just the experience that some of these women have 30 plus years, that's awesome. <laughs> so I'm just happy to be on here because my little teeny bit of time, like <laughs> compared to theirs, it, it's just awesome. So it's given me something definitely to look forward to. Wow. Well, thank you, Stacy. Thank you. I know, every, again, everyone's working really hard, and I thank you for taking the time to participate. Uh, and I see that Kalila, Miss Kalila, just promoted the uh, captain recently out of Baltimore, Maryland. Morning, Kalia. Uh oh. Kalila? All right, we'll, we'll get back to Kalila. She uh, probably stepped away for a while. I'm pretty sure she's working also. A lot's been going on in a lot of the major cities, unfortunately. I know Baltimore just had a tragic Baltimore, Philly, numerous places. Pray for other families. So I'm going to start off. My question number one is, it's from your perspective. Please identify one of the most difficult challenges African-American women face in the fire service. Um, so I'll go to uh, Chief Washington. All right. So um, this is an outstanding question. I think one of the biggest things is uh, being treated fairly. Um, for some reason, there's a, a, a stereotype against us as African-American women that we are angry. Um, we are placed in some of the same positions that our um, our peers are placed in. And um, our reaction is you, our reaction to the situation, they usually tag us as angry Black women. Um, but when our peers do the same thing, then they have great command presence. And... Um, that's just one example, but I think a lot in the fire service, when we look back, there are several things that um, we don't get the same consideration as our male counterparts, our male peers, and others. There's a different standard for us. And you know, all we want is fair and equal treatment. We're not asking for anybody to do anything special for us. Just treat us like that you treat everyone else. Thank you. Anybody else, anyone want to comment on that, on her response? Okay, we'll go to... Uh... Um, I, I just wanted to add, um, just piggybacking off, the, I'm Denise, um, okay. just piggybacking off what um, she just said. Just only, I think the, the aspect of, you know, just treating us fairly, like as we can all do the same job. Um, I know I've experienced guys, you know, trying to change my position on a truck based on what they think I'm capable of doing, you know, on a ladder. And 
I just thought that was kind of funny at first, but then I had to look at it like, wait a minute. <laughs> and then there's there's instances when, you know, guys will take a tool or something like that, thinking that they're being chival, is it chival, chivalrous? Chival, chivalrous, I don't know if I'm saying it right. But, you know, I'm just like, all right, we're, I, I understand that point of view, but, you know, I, I can do it. I, I appreciate it, but I can do it. I mean, I, just to follow up what you just mentioned, too, again, you have so much experience here. Yeah, and, I think it's, like, it's an uh, isolation. And, and individuals that, uh, that have, you know, survived and persevered in the service for, for 25, 30, some odd years. So. so that speaks to itself. I mean, um, that, was a num that was a challenge that if I were in a room and I, you know, someone mentioned something about the uh, abilities or not having the abilities to do I would tell him, I'd say, I'd rather have that young lady there and, <laughs> instead of you covering my back. And I've said that many times because fo folks just got out of line. Um, unfortunately, I was raised by um, my mom and three sisters, and I'm a baby. So when it comes to the Queens uh, representing, I'm a, I'm a staunch supporter of uh, women, especially women in the fire service and, and any type of leadership or position. And I, I just can't imagine what you face, not only as a woman, but as an African-American woman, fire service, the challenges go beyond. I think we'll hit on that. Um, Can I jump in and, and just add just one little thing to that? One well, of the other things, um, psychological things, is isolation, because uh, many times you are the only one which within your station or within your division or within your, you know, maybe within even within your battalion. And just... Um, Sometimes the days can be long because sometimes people don't even talk to you or, you know, there's limited um, interaction or, and it's, um, it can start, actually it can start, um, let's see, what's the word, best word to use here? Um, it can, psychologically, it can start messing with your mind for lack of a better um, way to phrase that because you are the only one. And then another thing is constantly having to prove oneself to show that I can do the job um, as a woman, but any, also, like as a black woman, because like I say, you do already come into the job and there is some preconceived notions about you. So sometimes it can be um, rather difficult. Absolutely. Proving that you are enough, that what you come to, you know, when you come to the table, that your authentic self is enough. Absolutely. Yeah. And as I think that our makeup, I know that our makeup is different as women. You know, we are nurturers. And Sheila said uh, uh, something big, as you know, um, we are put some time on this island by ourselves, And as nurturers, that's just not how we as women um, are made of. And, you know, mentally, that can be a huge bearing on your, on your um, everyday life when you're put on this island, when you're used to, you know, um, bringing everybody together, making everything right, wanting everybody to get along, working as a team. And then now you sat on this island by yourself and mentally that's a, a huge hardship in the professional environment when you feel like, oh my goodness, I'm on this island by myself. You know, if we have an incident, you know, am I going to look behind me and it's going to be somebody there or am I going to be by myself? So that really takes a toll on you mentally when you're put on that island and you don't know if you will have that support when you really, really need it. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, response, Chief. Um, so the next question, I would like to identify, if you could please identify one experience during your career that made you proud of serving your community. I think everyone can kind of hit on that. There's something that you knew that when you, you went on that call, you knew you made a difference because that individual knew you, you were from that community. And it just made a big difference in the, how the uh, incident was taken care of. Mine is most recent and believe it or not, it's not on my paid time. So as many know that Philadelphia experienced a tragic fire that took the lives of 12 citizens of Philadelphia. So right now we have volunteers from our chapter going out 
educating the community on fire safety and putting smoke alarms up. Uh, a back has been a backlog of 4,000 uh, requests uh, throughout the city. And then with the uh, pandemic happening, things slowed down. Also, the shipment slowed down. So one of my proudest moments serving the community is when I wasn't being paid to do it. When it when I actually set up there with the other volunteers and gave back to the community that gave so much to me. A lot of times, you know, we get out the community, we make a certain amount of money, we are able to live in different places and do better off. And we forget to look back at the community that that actually made us into who we are. So my proudest moment in the community was when it didn't come attached to a price tag. So, uh, Chief Forth, how, so how would you, if you had to speak to a younger firefighter, um, how would you convey that message? Uh, I know it's difficult, and, and I'm sure all of us have experienced it, but we seem to embrace the fact that community serves is so important in the beginning of our careers before we get on. And then some of us, once we get in that position, we, we forget where we go. Um, so if you can just talk about that or if anybody can respond. Yeah, um, you know, I wanna allow the other, you know, sisters to talk, but um, I wanna say that when we come on to this job, either if we were the interviewer or we were the interview, um, we that actually gave the interview, you hear the thing, uh, the term or the slogan or whatever, the cliche, I wanna do this because I wanna help people. So we got so fixed on saying it, but it does become a slogan. It does become a cliche because sometimes we are in these positions to help people and we're not helping. So be true to what you say that you're going to do. If it's really about dedication and service, it's not when you want to be dedicated and when you want to serve. It's sometimes when you don't feel like it. You know, uh, us as women, we have so many other things, like uh, our sister said, that we're nurturers or whatever. So when we come into the fire service, we're that, but often, you know, outside of the fire service, we're mothers, we're daughters and, and everything. So we have to be so much, but you have to remember your, your word is your bond. If you say that you're there to help people, make sure you're doing just that. Thank you. Um. Can I, I want to um, follow up behind the chief. Hard to follow up behind that, but <laughs> um, what she said is she's really speaking to my heart right now because um, I'm going to go also with more recent. So we're in the middle of a pandemic. And this is the first time I'm sure many of us have ever dealt with a pandemic in our lifetime, especially as first responders. Um, when we began to do vaccinations, the fire department partnered with our local health department because we just didn't have enough nurses to help out. So this shifted gears, right? Some people sign up, they wanna fight fires is what they wanna do. But like the chief said, we're here to serve the community and that means to serve them in with whatever capacity that we are capable with serving them. And to me, that goes beyond firefighting, right? So there's some people that this is what made me proud because I wanted to go out to do this because the people wanted it, right? The, the, that's the thing about being a firefighter. People are looking for help from us. They love when we show up. And when we showed up in this type of setting, it just changed, it just changed the game for me. And to be able to help people that way was different. And I recently got my list back with an officer, a different officer, because they disagree with us helping. And I'm thinking, I've gone out and done homebounds, meaning I'm risking my own health. You know, we risk our lives in fire fighting, right? I risk my health or my family's health to go out to these people's homes and find that they're in hospital beds. They're literally bed bound. They can't get out. So they can't get to get a vaccine. They can't get a COVID test because they were in home. So we're going to their house. To, to be able to provide this service for them on behalf of the city that's free for them. They're crying, 
They're grateful. They're like, thank you for doing this. I appreciate you. I know, you know, to see that the people genuinely appreciated that type of service, I I don't even have the words to explain the way it made me feel. And now I'm like, yeah, I want to do it. I want to do it. Granted, we do get paid to go out, but I don't do it for the overtime. I could get an overtime or extra money in a firehouse. A lot of firefighters won't put themselves on the front line at that level. They don't want to mask up, gear up, put all this stuff on and do COVID testing. They don't want to do that. So I'm just like, listen, whatever I can serve, I want to do it. And now that I see and I'm able to see the benefit of the community from it, I'm enjoying it. I love it. I still want to fight fires, but I want to go out and get vaccinations and do whatever too, because the community appreciates it. And Gary, I think that the um, International Association of Black Professional Firefighters, our model is um, all, all that I am, I owe, I live eternally in the red. And I feel like for my uh, 29, 30 years that I've been in the fire service, I've really tried to always go back to that. Um, yes, we're being paid to do a job. And yes, I... I have had great pleasure in doing that job, but the special moments come when, you know, you know, you have really impacted someone's life in a positive way and you're not being paid to do it. Um, you're doing those community service, you're volunteering, all of those other things and not to discount, you know, saving lives or anything like that, you know. We signed up to do this. We know that that's, that's what we are supposed to do and we're being paid to do. But the greatest gratification really comes from all of those community service projects where you volunteer your time. When a kid comes up to you and say, oh, wow, you know, um, it's because of you that I decide to stay in school, to stay off drugs, to graduate from high school, um, to become a lawyer you know, to pursue a career in the fire service. I think the greatest moments for me come when I hear things like that because the the operation side of it, yeah, they paying me to do that. You know, to run a fire department, they're paying me to do that. And yes, I have pleasure when all the successes come, but when I hear that I've truly impacted someone's life, um, I think that that's the biggest gratification of it all. And that's when I look back and say, hey, all the things that I went through, it was worth it because I made a difference in somebody else's life. Um, thank you, Chief Washington. Uh, Stacy, I would like you to chime in. Though. You said you were, you were been part of the department for what, six years? Yeah, so I've I've been a firefighter for six years. I've been on the department for seven. And so, uh, go ahead. I'm go sorry. Ahead. No, go ahead. Go, you can ask your question. No, I was going to say I just wanted you to. Uh, okay, uh, so just I mean I really wanted to kind of piggyback off of what Chief Forrest said. Um, the, this recent we've been out there trying to install smoke alarms into uh, areas that don't have them because the city's been backlogged. And um, it just seeing the people's faces, like they're just so happy to see it. It's like, yeah, yeah, I did that like years ago. You know, I did that a few years ago. Like, but no, I still need them. Come on in. They love to talk to you about stuff. And they, you know, they just want to, um, just happy to see you. And that just that feeling. Um, is just, it's just, it's an awful feeling. And, uh, I mean, an awesome feeling. And, um, you know, um, we have some, you know, and then just talking to them, educating them because we're able to get in their houses and see a lot of people don't know that, um, how, how space heaters should be plugged in. You know, we, this is the time where they got a lot of space heaters and different types of heaters in. And by us being able to go in, we can actually see, um, kind of what their house looks like. And there's a lot of people that plug space heaters into electrical cords and they just don't know. So just being able to educate the public and we don't know if what we did could potentially have saved them, you know? And then and, and, and just doing that and coming out on our free time and being able to do that, it was an also awesome feeling. And um, I'm just happy I was part of it.
Thank you. Uh, good morning, Kalila. Good morning. How are you? Good morning, hey. everybody. If you could just introduce yourself and uh, speak a little to uh, kind of piggyback off of what Stacy just spoke, talked about. Okay. So good morning, everyone. I'm Kalila Yancey. I'm a captain in Baltimore City Fire Department. Um, I'm also currently on the International Association of Black Professional Firefighters Executive Team. Um, I came in, I was having a little bit of trouble getting on to uh, Zoom, so I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but it sounds like it, everyone's talking about community service. Um, also, I've been with my department now for 17 years, going on 18. Um, community service to me is, is what we're here for. Um, like my department, our motto is pride protecting people. And that's just something that's always been instilled in me that I feel like I'm always supposed to give back to people, definitely with these different programs that um, initiatives that we have and just going the extra mile from um, putting in smoke alarms and doing when I do it with my, um, my group, the Falcon Blazers, we do the escape ladder programs that was a grant that the International Association of Black Professional Firefighters has. So we still go out and do that. Um, and just given the gratitude, the, the things we do for our seniors, we as a, our organization always reaches out to our department because our department does go out and do vaccinations for um, homebound citizens within the city that can't get out. And um, they were doing some testing for our employees, but we actually, we have so many employees, we had to reach out and get a company to do it. So <clears throat> as the organization, I can't send the company to people's homes, but we do try to get them any resources they need, set up different things. And it's just enjoyable to me. And it's also one of the main things that I really like about this job is getting kids in the community to be able to see that they can be a part of being in the fire service as well. Because a lot of times the reasons why they don't think they can be a part is because they don't see people like us. So that's why it's a major importance to me to be out in the community so that they can see if I can do it, they can do it as well. Wow, thank you. And again, we're praying for you and your families and your department members that are going through so much right now. Thank um, you. It's definitely a hard thing right now. Tough time. Um, so I'm going to move to our next question. Our next question is, how can the fire service improve, or how can the fire service improve with work relations pertaining to gender and race, and what significant changes would you recommend? Sheila. <laughs> Sheila, are you uh, here? I'm here. Okay, I think through, um, we can look at through education and training um, as far as improving for improvements. Um, so we're looking at continued diversity training. We could, um, and that has to be something that has to be ongoing because you can start diversity training and education, but if you don't continue with this, at some point it falls by the wayside and then you go back to the way things were. Um, through different exercises, team building exercises have been helpful. Um, you can't tolerate, you have to stop tolerating negative behaviors. And then you have to follow through, I'm sorry about that. You have to follow through with the um, with policies and procedures that are put in place. And you can't just pay lip service to it because um, you know there's policies and procedures that have been put in place, but that's it. Um, you have to have strong people who are gonna actually follow through and be the strong person and be the, um, uh, well, I'm saying enforcer, of these policies and recognize if someone has an issue, you have to be proactive in resolving things like this. Um, you have to look at setting and enforcing policies which, which do not promote hostile work environments. And that's a whole, whole umbrella of things that um, from removal on, unex, from removing unacceptable materials out of the firehouse that degrade and um, that may diminish um, women as a whole, because when you have those things and it's tolerated, it women, it, you tend to find that the treatment of women also tends to degrade. Um, and one of the big things is that we must continue to be vocal about change, because if, we, if we're not vocal about change, um, we can, stand here and we can beat the drum for a while. And then 
once people forget about it, again, it goes back to the way it was. So it's, a, it's an ongoing fight. It's an ongoing uphill battle, and it has to continue, and it has to be done. After I'm gone, um, I mean, people behind me are going to still have to do this in order to keep that change um, in place and move forward with it, with diversifying everything and bringing more women into the department. That's all I have. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Chief Washington, you being the chief of the department, um... Uh, what would how, what would be your response to that? Yeah, um, I would um, piggyback on a lot of what, what Sheila said. You know, um, I think that um, we have a lot of work to do with diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. Um, for a long time, um, the fire service uh, felt that they were arrived because they were able to say diversity, uh, but it's not about accepting or saying it's about what actions are you putting forward to make the change and you have to be uh have intentional actions when it comes to diversity inclusion um, and equity um and i don't think it's enough to just talk about it you have to have intentional actions about making change and until we as a fire service as a whole do that we're gonna keep spinning our wheels and we're gonna keep getting other fire chiefs come and saying, you know, how do I recruit more black African-American women? Or how do I recruit more women? You know, you have to change your process. You have to make sure that if you want that diversity in your department, that you have to make and have intentional actions to make those changes. It's just not enough to talk about it and to have a few classes about it uh, here and there. It has to be a part of your strategic plan. It has to be a part of your everyday operations if you're gonna make change. Okay, then I'm just gonna have a follow up with a quick question pertaining to that. So how about if you have, a, uh, um, and I've heard this numerous times, um, leaders of the so-called leaders of departments say that I can't identify any, a diverse group of African-Americans or females that qualify for the, what would you say to that? Um, I say it all the time and some of my colleagues don't like me to say it, but you have to look at your entry process. There are things that's put in place that are obstacles that prevent us as black women and us as African-Americans, uh, uh, it prevents us to being able to enter in the fire service. One thing that burns my heart and everybody knows is CPAC. You know, I think that you have to have a, a process because we a lot of we used to get hundreds and sometimes thousands of applications for firefighters. So I do understand that there needs to be a process to weed out some of the people so you can narrow your list. I get it, but there there is not a need for somebody to enter into the fire service knowing the job and being able to do it faster than everyone else. We as women, our bodies are made different, okay? Um, a lot of times we're not faster than the man just because of the makeup of our body. That does not mean we can't do the job as good as them and sometimes even better than them. So with the processes, the entry level processes like CPAT and there are others that don't have a name or acronym behind them, uh, but there are other processes that uh, are serve as obstacles to prevent us as African-American women, us as women, us as African-Americans in getting in the fire service because we don't have that long history of, you know, um, my grandfather was a firefighter and my great grandfather was a firefighter and my dad and my uncles. And so there was nobody to really prepare me for the job. Okay. So we don't, we are not, we don't often have that, um, that uh, advantage that others have. So when we come to these processes like CPAP, then of course, there are going to be people that beat us out or it might be somebody or it might be that we don't meet the uh, primary objective of the task. So I think this process is like uh, entry level processes like CPAP need to be banned if we're really going to diversify the fire service because um, every, fire every fire department that I know, they teach you how to be, the fire be a firefighter. You know, you can't be scared of heights. You can't be claustrophobic. 
You have to have some upper body strength, but you don't have to know how to do the job before you get there. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, let me go to, uh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Nancy. I would like to say something and piggyback on what Chief Washington said, because uh, the chief in my department, when he came here, he felt the same way. I have um, Chief Miles Ford, and he saw the disparity in the hiring process. So he wanted to change things. So we had got um, a validated test that's nationally recognized where um, it's put to, it was put together by a company, and then we had people within our department go through it. But the thing that helped him be able to help bring people in is when we do it, we do a mentor session with the people to train them and get them up. Because before, when we were using CPAP, we recognized that people can bring those CPAP certifications from all different places. Well, with in the inner city, most people aren't even exposed to the fire service. They don't have the means to go get those certificates from other places and bring them here within our city to work. So um, by us reaching out to a national place and getting an accredited test and being able to help the people get through, I think that is starting to create the change that we need within our department to help more women and minorities get in. Um, if I could jump in, uh, I, I feel the same way Chief Washington does about um, CPAP. Uh, like I've been on a job 16 years and I didn't have to do CPAP, CPAP but right now, we now require CPAP. And I saw um, a big change once we once we implemented that requirement, it was uh, about 10 or 11 years before we got another female on the department. Uh, they had their arguments. I feel how I feel about it. So what we did was because we're, we can't just ban it right now, right? It becomes this huge thing. So we did have the city come into agreement to help us build our, our own CPAP training facility, which currently now I am overseeing and um, I'm getting ready to, I am over the recruitment that we're getting ready to launch. And I have to tell you that without this facility, we recently got a few women on, but only because of this facility. Why, like Chief Washington said, now we are able to provide them a space where they can come and be educated, where they can learn one. It's not that we can't do it. We just don't have the exposure. We don't have the opportunity other people have, and we don't have the awareness. And what we find is once they get it, it's like, okay, there's somebody coaching me through it. Somebody's walking me. They're encouraging me versus on when they go up to C take CPAT where we're from, it, <laughs> nobody like us is proctoring these exams and nobody's supporting them and nobody's like you got this you can do this come on girl get it get it get it there's none of that um if anything they feel that isolation they feel that rejection without people even saying it so that right there discourages them so we're trying to change that um and it's helping our pass rate i'm still in disagreement with the cpap but we have looked for ways to circumvent um, to ensure that our people are ready to go take this test because they're just making things harder, but we just have to we have to develop something to get five ten steps ahead of them, like we always had to do. And uh, really quick, Cindy, I wanted to touch on um, that question. I recently was invited into a a meeting with a local fire department. Um, they have not one minority on their department. Um, they just got uh, their second woman, which was 20 years later, the first woman, she was, she's retiring and they're just putting another female on. Um, and I was invited into the meeting because they were asking the question that you asked, Mr. Tenney, what can we do to help our department become more diverse? How do we get more women to come on our department? How do we get more minorities to apply? And the, the thing was, my question was, why now? You have, this department is not brand new. Why now do you want us? Like, why are you looking for us? Because somebody's forcing you to look for me. Otherwise you still wouldn't. If nobody had forced your hand, you wouldn't be looking for me. So you have to explain, why do you think I'm a benefit to you outside of that? <laughs> you know, that's the real question. And I said, now you're asking for somebody to come and be the first, which we know when you look at it, you're like, wait a minute, y'all got no black Y'all have no, I don't know if I want to go be the first. I don't know if I want to 
if I'm up for that challenge, because it's a challenge and it's taxing and it's mentally um, stressful. There's a lot, you have to be very strong. And I think an experienced person, like some of us up here that have been through it and understand a fire service can go into something like that and know how to deal with it. But somebody that's just coming on and knows nothing about the fire service, it's going to be a little challenging to get them to want to apply to your department because they don't see anybody that looks like them and they're already feeling like they're not welcome. But they are, look, I just wanted to put that out there because you mentioned it, that to be across at this table and this man this chief go, listen, I, how do I get more people that are like you? Qualified. As long as you have identified that we are out here and we are qualified and we have these licenses and these certificates, know that it's there. But you need to come where we are. You have to meet us where we are. And they're and not I doing think, that. And I so, think that speaks specifically to their recruitment efforts too. Because I currently had a meeting with a uh, chief of a department and you know, I looked at, I said, what what type of recruitment efforts? What have you done to recruit? Have you gone into the schools? Have you gone into the churches? Do you have any programs in the school? What have you done? And, you know, the data speaks for itself, right? And, and that follows, that goes to my next question. And I want everybody to hit on it, but we have 15 minutes left. Um, can can I ahead. say something um, before we move on to the next one? And I'll make it real quick. But who are setting the qualifications? Who's setting the policies? Who's setting the standards? So you're saying that is recognized by is tried and proven, but we got to look at who's sitting on these boards that are making these standards and policies. So I don't care if you're a accredited organization, if you don't have one minority sitting on that board, is it really reputable? Like, is it really the standard we should be going by? So I, I just wanted to add that that piece. Okay, because that goes to the old adage, whether if you're not at the if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Um, I mean that speaks volume. Uh, so the, the next question, I think each person from each department could kind of uh, uh nationally the percentage of females in the fire service is very low. African American females are even lower. Um how many African Americans are employed in your department? So I, we could just go from Denise to Chief Washington to everyone from each city. Uh, I, I think Chief Flores might be more qualified to answer the how many question, okay. but at the why, um, I can only speak from my personal perspective. Um, I, I became a firefighter because I witnessed my dad, you know, as a firefighter growing up. Um, I didn't really see too many female examples uh, growing up until I actually started pursuing the process. Um, then I, I saw a woman like, you know, Chief Forrest and other women on a job, not even as medics. I didn't even see the, the female medics. They, they were there though. They were there, but they weren't advertised to me. So um, that's, that's my short answer to why I think the percentage is low because they're not, when we're recruiting on the, now it probably is a little different, but um, I don't think it's enough um, visual, you know, representation. Thank you. Uh, Chief Washington. So um, right now, um, at least 75% of my staff are African-American. Um, and uh, I think 30% are, are women. Um, I'm in a unique position. Um, as you all know, there are not very many um, uh, women um, African-American fire chiefs um, in the United States. Um, I'm one of 10. And um, interesting enough, um, I didn't have to do a whole lot of work as it relates to employing more African-Americans. I can say that when I got there, it was the total opposite. I think African Americans only made up maybe 30, 25 to 30% under my department. But I say it's interesting now because um, not everybody wants to work for me. Not everybody wants to work for a Black woman. So I did not have, I, there were no intentional actions by myself to, um, to create the change. It just happened because. You know, not everybody want to work for a black woman. So um, I'm okay with that. 
Um, but I did not have to do any hard work to um, to transform my department. Thank you, thank you, Chief. Um, I'm, um, I'm going to go next to uh, Chief Forrest and then uh, Lieutenant Moore. So, just females in the fire service in the fire department that includes fire service paramedics, EMTs, and, and firefighters. We have about like 12% and um, African-Americans period on the job is about 28%. However, the civilian positions are also included in that number. And I've been trying to get a breakdown of uniform and civilian. And all, although we need the civilian employees, I, I don't you know, take anything away from them. But the numbers are, are, are not real as how many are really in a fire service un uniform when you combine everything. So to me that the numbers are a little padded in favor of to say, yeah, we do have women, we have 12%. But if we break it down a little bit further, we know that that percentage is much lower of uniform fire service uh, personnel, but we can't get the number. And then the civilians are mainly women too. So our, our numbers are being padded to not tell the truth and bring more on. Thank you. Um, for us, we have uh, approximately, maybe about 300 firefighters. Uh, we don't have fire and EMS combined like that. So these are actual service members. Um, and out of that close to 300 number, nine are women. And out of that nine uh, of women, only two are African, no, three are African American. And two out of the three are officers, which is myself. Um, there's another female officer. Uh, we're the only two uh, women in leadership positions. Um, we have no other women in leadership positions at all. So that's where we are standing right now. Um, we have two engineers, which are drivers that are females, but out of that, it's just three. So there's nine, three African-American women, uh, two Hispanic women, uh, one, I'm not sure what her nationality is, and the rest are Caucasian. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, Sheila. Sheila? Yes, I'm here. Okay. So our, de our department is comprised of over 1,600 members. And with the breaking down, um, it's like 42.2% of white male. We only have 7.8% of black male. And out of that, we have 1.3% of black females, which equates to roughly 20 to 21 females out of a 1,600 member department. Those numbers are not very good at all. Um, our chief recently recognized that. So through a series of uh, peer groups, they, um, which my daughter was actually part of the peer group. Um, she's also in the fire department. They, there was a development of a, um, which, which is a ratio, the fire ratio um, equality action plan. And with this plan, it's targeting, bringing in more, um, more women, minorities, and actually tr um, bringing the numbers up in order to make the uh, department more diverse. Because um, for such a large department and have such a small amount of diversity is those numbers are just, they're staggering and they're actually is unacceptable. I think some of the things as far as with women, with minority women, is that they're not being directed toward the fire service. And they're also being told, or they may think that they can't do the job um, instead of being um, actively recruited. It's like, okay, yeah, you can do this job. Look at us. We can, we're can. we doing the job and we're doing a good job at it. So there's, um, we're looking at targeting, you know, like I said, more, um, more people or more women in the community and looking at places where these uh, this would be this targeting would be more effective thank you and stacy and then kalila we have probably about five more minutes left so uh after that i really quick i have a uh, two more questions after that and i just uh, so if we can move forward I appreciate. okay so um 
I'm not, again, I, I'm not really familiar exactly with the numbers. Um, pretty much whatever Chief Forrest said. Um, in the little bit of time that I've been on, I've seen a slight increase in the amount of females that have joined the fire service for Philadelphia. Um, however, I know with me, I didn't come on because I saw a female firefighter. It wasn't like, oh, I saw her. Oh, this is who I wanted to be. I just came on because I was an EMT and that's how I ended up getting on. I did, um, apply for the fire, the firefighter, you know, to be a firefighter. But, um, I started off as an EMT and as an EMT, I started seeing more female firefighters being on the job as an EMT. But, um, I think just it's, it could be intimidating for, uh, women that, cause you don't see any other women. Um, I think the thought of being a firefighter can be a little intimidating because you don't see other women doing it. And it's like, well, can I do this job? I'm not really sure if I can do it or not. Um, I think that we're trying to get a little bit better with, um, showing our faces more. And I think it should even be, I think it should increase more. Um, I think there should be more women, um, firefighters that are on the job being out there with, with recruiting and things like that, um, to make these, to let these women know that, yes, we, we are here. I, uh, where I work at is, a um, a station in West Philly. And people have lived in the area for years and they are just so fascinated if they see me outside. Oh my gosh, I got to tell my daughter about you. Um, gosh, I've, they, uh, she's never seen a, a, a female firefighter and they're like just stunned. I'm like, yeah, we're here. We just, you know, they just don't see us enough. They see men, you know, uh, some African-American men, but mostly white men. Um, so it, it can be a little intimidating. We have one minute left, so I really want to get this question in. Um, so I'm going to ask, uh, I'll ask Chief Washington, what economic and social advantages come from recruiting and hiring individuals who grew up in your community, i.e. schools and own homes and pay income and real estate taxes? What do you think that brings to the community? Okay. So, um, uh, Gary, I would be happy to answer that, but I know um, uh, Captain Yancey hadn't really had an opportunity to okay. talk. So, you know, if you don't mind, I would like to defer to her since she hasn't really had an opportunity to speak. Okay, great. Okay. All right, for, for me, I can definitely speak on that because being born and raised in Baltimore City, educated here, and I feel like um, sometimes we have coming from a city that sometimes people can't understand the dynamics and the social economic problems that you have, they can't relate to the people here. They don't know how to serve their community, not being a product of it. So I think that when you recruit and get people from here, they understand the social economic challenges that we have within the department and they can um, serve the community better. And also when you're within and you're paying taxes, that's what pays our paycheck. So if you own homes and um, you know, different businesses within the city. Those are the things that pay us. Um, so I think that that's why it's very important to recruit within the area, get people that are familiar with the people that are around them. I think that's one of the things that a lot of departments may miss sometimes, especially when they're bigger departments, like in the inner city, like um, I commend Philly a lot because they try to get people from within their city and we try that as well. But I think Overall, you can understand the community, you can understand the challenges, just like what we're going through right now with the loss of deaths and we're taking a hit for a lot of beating on social media about um, the way we do things. It's hard for people on the outside when you've never been a product of our environment to judge how we do things here. Everything, yes, the fire services are alike in many ways, but each different area has their own problems and way they deal with things. And I think that when you get people that are from those areas, they can understand it much better. Thank you. Yeah. 
As I got uh, enough, I'm have to do another show. Y'all to listen, uh, I'm never quitting on my mission. I'm on uh, with what I'm getting. Got some ambition, this new addition, fill the positions. Looking at the void in myself, I'm feeling what's missing. Better watch the way you're going. Better go in the right direction. In the moment, you're stressing, but you're going to count the lessons. And I know that for certain, keep on working. Open curtains, haters swerving, because they ain't ready for your final version. I'm never going to give up, give up. I guess I'm wrong. I got to do a better job of this, too. But uh, we're definitely going to reach out to you to help. We need some help, many carriers, and uh, again, God bless you. Again. Good luck. Take care. This is my road, let's camera action, I'm ready to go. It's too long, we face them stones, now you gon' face it, dawn, you waiting for. I said from night to dawn, I write my wrongs, alarming competition with warnings, ice galore. Now I'm running toward them highlights, I'm finished being a quitter, but little, little by little, they joking, telling some riddles. Now I'm in my section, ain't willing to give up. Know you getting knocked down, but you gotta get up. I'm never gon' give up, give up Fall down, I just gotta get up, get up, hey Cause this is my road Let's camera action, I'm ready to go I'm never gonna give up, give up Fall down, I just gotta get up, get up, hey Yeah, this is my road Let's camera action, I'm ready to go